Is Tamago still existed? No. Oh shit. Alright. It's fine then. That's sad. Alright, so. <laughs> <It did. laughs> I'm trying it out now, my first time. It feels so weird, but yeah. Why do you so, feel weird? I have no clue actually. So Would hey, it be guys. better if I talked closer to the mic? Like this? Not really. That make you more comfortable? No, not 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 really to say. Alright, so hey guys, so today I'll be talking towards Dane We <laughs> Dane. Which guys? Where are they? <laughs> Is it live? <laughs> it's not live, I'm just recording, god damn it. Hey guys, be, in the chat. hey guys in the chat, I'll be talking to Dane Whedon from <coughs> Jobless, Jobless, right, right? Occupation Jobless? Jobless by choice. Jobless by choice. You know what, it's better for you to describe yourself, so let it go. Dane, who are you? To people who do not know you. Who am I? Yes, who am I? Who are you? That's a very deep question. Of course. <laughs> I don't know, I, I did stuff. Did stuff like what? I did stuff in esports, mostly like pertaining to media. Mm -hmm. A little Ex bit of writing, a little <laughs> bit of social media, a little bit of like content production, um, some sales, some DDM. What what are the big ones that you did before in the past that got you known? Like I know you through IGN. What other di things did you did? That's all I know to be honest. IGN People fanatic. People only associate me with IGN. I was like. Uh, I was more vocal because I, you know, we wanted to attract uh, people to know that IGNC existed. Mm -hmm. So with IGN, you know, like I made an effort for people to know that I was with IGN. Mm -hmm. But with everyone else I've worked for, I don't, I don't really like, uh, I don't update my Facebook or anything like that or LinkedIn stuff. Really, I just, uh, I work for IGN. I worked for Fnatic. I worked for uh, gamers very briefly. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wrote for the Esports Observer. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. pretty much it. Hey, actually, we jump. You know, random freelance here and there. Okay, we jump right to it, yeah, because like I know you from IGN, and you said that the reason why you're in IGN is you wanted to get IGN C known, so you're like making news articles on Facebook and all. Why aren't you doing it for the rest of the organizations you're working with to no, get yourself the, more known? The difference known? is, is like uh, for IGN, I was like. When you do social media for a team, people follow the team for mm -hmm. the team, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, it's uh, much more organically viable. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you're a publication, there's very few publications, specifically with gaming stuff, mm -hmm. that people actually like go to or follow. So you have to somehow try and, you know, get people to associate you mm -hmm. with the platform. And then if they if they like what you say, they might, you know go to the platform so it's like join dota has like 80 percent direct traffic where people actually type join dota i can't remember where i read that stat but it was from someone um maybe on linkedin i can't remember who it was but they put that out there which makes sense to me because like you people know that and they go there mm -hmm. whereas most other stuff like you know dot esports and stuff like that they have to all be seo so it's uh you know it's a whole different ball game as compared to when you're doing it for a team so that's why it was like more vocal when I was at IGN, and because uh, I wanted people to go to our website, basically. Oh, in, in, um, in my in the thought of my head, it was you're vocal because you're using IGN to build your funnel or your audience in that sense, so that whenever you go to any other organizations like Fnatic, gamers or what, you can somewhat bring your audience along in that sense, so you bring more value to the company itself. Wouldn't no, like, that was what I, I thought? Even, that was what no, I thought. I don't, I don't. I don't even have a page. I don't even have a page that you can like. I just have my... You have a blue stick on Facebook. <laughs> I just have a personal Facebook and a, a small Twitter. You know? I, I mean, the thing is, I don't think page is necessary. It's more regards to like, it can be text messages, it can be emails, it can be, you know, WhatsApp groups, who knows? It's basically just the following an audience, right? Wouldn't you say so yourself? Like the page doesn't matter on Facebook because an overseas like Twitter... I don't believe I have uh, any kind of audience outside my circle of friends. You know, you like in the past, some things I said because I was friends with like other journalists. Mm -hmm. So there were some times where things I said were like became more widespread because they reported on it, mm -hmm. which is really just one time. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that was like a few times, right? Not once, one having time. Having a following, quote unquote. Yeah, but it's not like I'm like a influencer or anything. I'm not like one of those 
You know, there's people on Twitter where it's like, uh, what is he, the guy who calls himself like the esports writer and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Uh, that few. Rob guy, I don't know. But they always just tweet news. But I've never seen them, like, I don't even know who they write for. I just see them tweet, and I'm, I always wonder, like, what do they actually do? Like, who do they, what, are they publishing articles somewhere? I don't even know. I just see them, like, tweet news and it gets shares, but it's not going back to any website or anything like that. Um, I mean, I would say in some sense, you can be considered, like, influence is a pretty broad term, right? Like, you influenced me to know more about RGNC when you were there. Wouldn't that count, wouldn't that for you count as influencing in some sense? Not no. in the, not in the nature of the term. I mean, it's pretty, pretty... I mean, it's a fucking stupid term, but let's be real. <laughs> influence, it just means someone who has lots of people who like their pitches. And there's very few people who have genuine influence. And those people are like, you know, like your shrouds and whatnot. Oh, that's true. And your PewDiePie's and stuff like that. <laughs> but I don't think someone who, like, posts a picture of their butt on Instagram... I don't, I don't think influencer really suits the term, but... No, I would never consider myself... Something like that. No, what, what, what do you think suits the term if you don't want to use the word influencer? Because it's a very well, like a very wide set term. I don't know, online whore? I, don't, I can't <laughs> think of... It's... Uh, I've never seen a positive analytics article about influencer marketing. You know, like every everything I read about it consistently says how, how much the industry is based on fake numbers and viewbots. And as someone who has worked in media for a little while now, it's very clear how how much fake traffic there is. Uh, so I don't know. I really don't believe in it at all, except for the people who have, as I said, like, you know, your shrouds and whatnot that have genuine followings. That makes sense because, I mean, I, I recently read up to there's a lot of, like, fake numbers generated, but I also read the other end where it's mostly in US, where a lot of dropshipping e-commerce stuff mainly use influencers to drive their traffic and sales just based off proper ad campaigns on Facebook and Instagram swipe up stories. So in some sense, even Facebook, uh, even Facebook uses fake numbers. I mean, didn't they just get sued in the like Supreme Court or something for like inflating video numbers? You know, I, sometimes I open up Facebook now and it just puts a fucking Mobile Legends stream on my Facebook in multiple in the news feed, in the side, and it's like that. My view and impression is going to be counted for these streams. I fucking hate it. Nothing against the people doing it, but it's like Facebook puts it in front of me. I, I don't want to watch it. I don't consume it. I don't. I don't take note of any of the, the ads or anything like, like that. But because Facebook can just put it there, that person gets my my view in their reach. So how many people does it just put it in front of? And the selling point of esports to marketers is like, esports is a way to deeply connect with the younger generation. Like they're more engaged. They don't watch TV. You know, they're too they're too consumer savvy to fall for those ads. But Esports is like, oh, but you know, that's the advertising gold mine. When in reality, the numbers are like just so inflated by people who aren't actually watching it. So, so here's the in my humble opinion. No, 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 I agree with you. So, here's the one I was interested about. Do you think it's Facebook putting up wrongly, or do you think it's the company that's running the marketing ads for the mobile legends or whatever doing a shit job at it, showing it to no, audiences that don't like it? Facebook is a, a really horrible platform. Uh, like anyone who's managed a big page knows that you're basically paying to access your fans. Yeah. Like Pay you, media. It, it's like a, you may as well, you may as well have to have like a subscription fee to have a page on Facebook. Cause if you don't give them money, unless you're one of the few pages that are like, like this is not the case with like, um, you know, teams, for example, mm. where it's like their, their followings are very organic. But if you're like a, you know, a new publication, and they have like, it's like it's a brand new publication. They have like 300,000 likes, but then each of their posts only has like one comment, two likes and one share. You know that they are having to pay Facebook every time to get any kind of reach or engagement on their mm -hmm. posts. And I guarantee like, I don't want to name names, but I can pick one right now that you can see has almost a million followers now um, because they paid Facebook to advertise their page. Mm -hmm. And so you just get likes. When you pay them, you get likes. Um, but then those people aren't, they're not really genuine likes. Mm -hmm. And then Facebook never puts your <laughs> content on their page again. So it's like, you're just paying for the like. But Facebook doesn't even put your content in front of them after they've liked it. When you um, said, 
Yeah, when you say paid for likes, do you mean more like paid for an ad campaign or just no, buying so, likes? I mean, like you can pay Facebook to, to put your page. Like, you know, there's sometimes you'll see page promotions come up. Yeah, yeah, that's, like, that's boosting. It's literally just boosting, yeah? So we're, we're talking about this generate boosting, not to say like a proper strategized funnel ad campaign, marketing campaign via Facebook or Google AdWords. We're not talking no, about no, that. No, 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 no. Boosting is putting your posts in front of people. Um, but when you're actually promoting like likes on your page, mm -hmm. it puts your like page in front of them. It'll be like, you know, whatever, PUBG mobile. Literally just know, buying social. likes. Yeah. It's, it's not even like putting out ads, content to attract them to like it. It's just forcefully buying likes in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. And there's certain markets, you know, like, like Vietnam, for example, where people kind of just like everything. <laughs> that comes in front of them and then but you'll never get any reach out of it so it's like the numbers will seem really good um but good luck monetizing them ever so do you think the main issue is them not knowing how to use marketing to monetize it or what is it about no the main issue is people believing that you can like monetize it like it, it's it all goes facebook's way in the end you know like they're the ones who benefit from this but i think there was recently a guy from like college humor the old website mm -hmm who discussed like uh yeah sort of video article. how they changed their marketing strategy from their website to publishing on facebook because the numbers were so insane on facebook mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it yeah it just broke them because you just can't monetize it and the only reason the only way that people hope to monetize their facebook pages is like through uh you know like brand sponsors all right and that's when you just have this influencer market because that's all you can really mm -hmm. do you know? Do you think it's Unless the... you're like Disney or something like that. <laughs> do you think it's the organizations of brands fought for not expanding? Like, they're throwing all their eggs to the Facebook market, you could say, yeah? They're not trying to expand, nah. let's say, YouTube, Twitter, Snapchat, fault. so on and so forth. Marketing is hard. Most of the time, people look stupid. And uh, there's very few people who are like gen genuinely great at it. And uh, I don't know. I think marketing is a really bizarre industry. And people fail more often than not, but when they're right, everyone praises them. I don't think it's anyone's fault. I think it's Facebook is very greedy, but obviously they're just trying to monetize their platform as best they can. I bet anyone else would do the same in their situation. No, it's, it's no one's All right. Fault. All right. How about we? Okay. How about this? Enough about marketing. Let me, let's talk more about your enjoyment or your experience in Malaysia esports? How has Malaysian esports in the past few years been treating you? I know you have not been there for a while, but while you were there before you'd make I a move? I was there in July. Yeah, I mean, um, how, how was it? Uh, Malaysian esports is weird because it's like, for all of the, all of the dumb shit mm -hmm. that plagues Malaysian esports, it actually still seems incredibly healthy on a realistic level. Mm -hmm. Like, there's still so many tournaments, so many lands, on all tiers of competition. Mm -hmm. From pro to amateur to, to into school, or I should say like college clubs and stuff like that. There's actually so much stuff. Um, obviously, it doesn't meet the expectations of what like the industry of bullshit around it, around it like claims it to be. Like all the esports evangelists, um, whatever the fuck that means, who, uh, you know, bang on like it's the second coming of Jesus and that, uh, you know, brands that engage in esports make billions of dollars. Um, but if you just strip away all of the, uh, all the hyperbole and all of the hype, mm -hmm. it, it seems actually pretty healthy to me. There's just like an industry of nonsense around it, which, which clouds it. And that's usually where the, the drama comes from, I would say. What, what, what would you think can change this industry of nonsense? Like the fake noise, right? People saying that how esports is, just, just put your money and you get guaranteed returns. You know, you'll be a multi-millionaire, what so, what so forth. How do you think it can be changed? There's misconceptions from almost every party. Actually, misconception is probably not the right the right word because that makes it sound like I'm calling them like dumb or something like that. It's more just like what they want from it. Like sometimes I think the players are very unrealistic. Like they have expectations mm -hmm. that things should be provided for them like they deserve it. So it's like, you know, let's say there's a, a tournament... Um, like a CS tournament and it's using laptops, mm -hmm. you know, like that's not ideal by anyone's standard for mm -hmm. competitive integrity and like, but if that's the only sponsor that ponied up money 
and you want to make money, and I'm sorry, but you, you have to play under those conditions. And it's like, you shouldn't be upset necessarily at uh, the tournament. Let's say MSI comes in for yeah. some, you know, whatever the recent tournament, Taiwan Excellence, maybe they were using um, mm -hmm. using laptops or whatever. It's like, you shouldn't be mad at uh, the organizers or MSI. Be mad at, like, HP for not, like, for not sponsoring it themselves and getting 144 hertz monitors or whatever for everybody. It's not the fault of, like, you know, you take money where you can get it. So if a sponsor says, we're not going to get, like, we, you need to use our product, but they're giving money, then what can you do? And then on the other flip side, uh, organizers obviously seem to fuck up every tournament. There's something that goes wrong. And uh, it's it's quite bizarre. One of the big issues I, I, I noticed a lot in relation to esports was the amount of times that pro teams were banned mm -hmm. from events. And it's like, well, that's not esports then. It's, it's, you can't call something you know, competitive when you're banning the competitive teams and you can't expect that, you know, people talk about brands do this thing when they, when they, everything a brand puts money into, unless it's direct charity is about their, their reach, right? Their marketing, yep. but they'll try to sell it as if they're supporting something. So they'll sponsor like we we are supporting Malaysian esports, you know, uh, but <laughs> in reality, if you ban all the teams that are playing professionally, which is what they do quite regularly. It's like, oh, you're a pro team, so you can't play in this tournament because you'll win. And people won't enter because you're in there. But it's like if you ban everyone who's actually investing in esports from your esports tournament, and they're the only people that can enter are amateurs, who are you actually supporting? Because it's not like people are going to win, win a fucking Razer headset and be like, well, I'm going to go pro now. You know, that, that's just fun for them, and then they'll move on. And then you ban all the people who are actually putting, like, full-time practice and money into, like, making a team. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really bizarre. Uh, Do you think it's the brand's fault? The logic, but... Or the, organization, or the organization's fault for that aspect? I guess that would be the organizer who decides it, because they're the one who has to pitch it to sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, but I just don't understand banning pro teams. Uh, from esports, unless it's like, for example, if it's like a college tournament, that makes sense. Then it makes sense, right? If you, if a team has someone who's played at TI or something like that, <laughs> probably it's not the best. That's true. Um, but if you're just like, you know, if you're just uh, Logitech or something, mm. and you're hosting a tournament, and if you call it esports, and you say you're supporting esports, and then you ban esports players and only have amateurs in it, and it really doesn't line up. Yes. Sir. So that's okay. one of the weirder things that I encountered. Well, okay, in like the your previous point, right? Remember you told me about so you told them about how people, esport players, complains about playing on laptops and all this kind of stuff for sponsors. Do you think this is mostly esports players in general in Malaysia or across the world being too entitled in that sense, or they do not understand the reality behind the scenes of the sponsors, the mindset of the organizers? Entitled. There's a lot of stories of genuinely players getting taken advantage of and fucked over so it's like they're entitled to complain but you have to understand let's say you get picked up by fanatic mm -hmm. and they don't buy you jerseys they don't give you your stuff mm -hmm. you know yeah you can complain mm -hmm. you know they oh they just raised 20 million dollars why, why aren't they taking care of us but if you join a team that mm -hmm. has like no notable sponsor um no big following and it's like you are the product as mm -hmm. a player. And I've seen people who play for teams mm -hmm. who are just like small teams where an owner has tried to build something in the hope that we'll get the thing started, we'll get some numbers and some results, I'll put a price to that, I'll go to sponsors, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll scale from there. Um, but what players need to understand is when you join those, those teams, you are the product. You, you are the core of the business, but you'll see, like, I've seen teams that have like lost every fucking qualifier that they were in and then complained that the team didn't deliver on their promises. And that blows my fucking mind because you, you, are, you are the product and you're dead on arrival. So how are they meant to fucking sell it and scale up? But I think that's a two-way street because a lot of the time the, 
esports owners are like 35 years old dudes that have money and they're like want to look cool in front of kids or something like that. it's like they they want to have that like alpha male i'm the boss feeling and they're like esports are like you know i'll start a team and they know they have in the picture of the head of how to scale it and make money but if your product fails you know and nobody wants it nobody's following it and they they lose every fucking qualifier yeah. you can't sell it so you're like well sorry guys you know i i can't pay you salary because like the business didn't work out and then those players complain uh that that interaction blows my mind a little bit but it's two sides it's the players not understanding that that uh get a product they yeah. are a major part of the business mm-hmm. they have to put in the also, work yeah but it's also the owner i think sometimes they don't clearly communicate that to the players because they want to look like the boss mm-hmm. you know i'll take care of you don't worry you know, let's go get nice food and all that <laughs> so and then they're more confused when it all falls apart right so so yeah talking about how you, you talk about 35 year old kids not kids adults in some sense making up companies or organizations in the esports scene because of that there's like an influxuation in the past few years about startups in esports in malaysia am i right or wrong do you know about it what yeah, do you think about I mean, it like well, what do you think about it is it a good thing is it a bad thing like overall what do you think about it you mean like the startup industry and there, there were fun like a ton of esports organizations small pops pop up here and there everyone wants to be the, do their own thing that's how it is yeah everyone wants to be their own boss wants to do their own thing how do you think it's been going you mean, so far? Still around i don't know i wouldn't even think so it's um any good ones that come to your mind like the ones that did well Oh, I mean, Geek Fab's still around, right? I don't know exactly how well they're doing. They seem to always dabble into new projects. Mm-hmm. I think maybe they sold one of their players for a lot of money. Maybe Skem when he went to Complexity. Maybe they got a, a bit of a cash injection. But Geek Fab's yeah. owner was like, he has a few companies under his name too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, I think so his experience Evos would be similar, where it's like, uh, I think Ivan has mm-hmm. other businesses, maybe a restaurant or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know exactly, but... You can tell the difference between people who are a bit more experienced, savvy, mm-hmm. uh, experienced, savvy, and the people who just like think esports will be their ticket. Um, Easy like money. Starting their first business. How many people out there right now in the scene in esports do you think are doing it just for the money and the fame? Well, everyone's doing it just for <laughs> the money. Give me a break. So no one's doing it out of pure passion or they love it and they want to make a career. They want to grind, passion, make a career out of it. Your passion and money are not mutually exclusive. Isn't mm. that the dream? Isn't that what everyone wants? You want to mix money and passion? I mean, that, I mean it sounds fun, but it's not easy. It's like the 0.1% goal because everyone wants it. It's the dream, right? It's a fucking nightmare. No, I mean, uh, no, I don't think it's like you're either in it for money or in it for passion. The people who say they're in it for passion are usually the failures. I would say, oh. um, you know, like, I don't think passion and money is mutually exclusive. I don't think you can make money without passion in the industry because everyone that does it, who's clearly doesn't give a shit always ends up being, you know, quite a failure. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So yeah, with the rise of esports gaming, there's, you know, the rise of esports influences and all this kind of stuff. What, what, what is your take on it since we talked about it earlier? What's your take about esports influencers in Malaysia? In Malaysia specifically, right? Who are who is an esports influencer in Malaysia? Like that how, speaks English. How did you find influencers? How how did you find an esports influencer? Yeah. Do well, they okay? So in the context of the market, let's let's take that definition mm-hmm. of influencer, which is someone who has a large following mm-hmm. of people interested in esports. So mm-hmm. it's like, but I found that most of the biggest ones speak, uh, you know pass as their primary language they don't they don't speak english as their primary language right mm-hmm. like can you think of anyone that's big that speaks english i'm not sure i haven't followed the scene for a while <laughs> i don't i don't think i think it's mostly mostly in bahasa which makes sense because you know the majority of the population is malay but um i, I don't know i there's streamers that get ridiculous numbers uh that just come up on my feed and uh, especially on Facebook and I, they must be earning some some big money because I know how much Facebook gaming is paying out for the big streamers at the moment mm-hmm. and it's a lot but as someone who only speaks English I don't think I ever saw anybody who was like delivering content consistently primarily in English that was big 
what, what do you define as a good influencer in some sense? Would you say the amount of reach, the amount of engagement? Yeah, to me, the only thing that matters is organic engagement. Mm -hmm. Reach is good, but engagement, engagement, um, engagement is, I don't know, probably the biggest factor. And if they get good engagement, I mean, if like, to me, if like some more than, let's say they have 300,000 followers mm -hmm. and 50% of those followers engage with a the post, then mm -hmm. that's wildly successful. That's a, big num that's a big number to ask, right? 50% hmm? <laughs> of 200,000, that's a pretty big ass. Yeah, but like that, that, exactly, that to me is successful. If like half of your audience is interacting with you, mm -hmm. then you're, you're, a, you're a gold class influencer. But does it matter how much of it is being converted to sales or is it being more used towards the top of the funnel where it's just awareness, awareness, awareness and the other strategies from the marketing campaign nah, would secure it. The barometer I always use is thinking about how much money businesses pay for like a billboard on the highway. Mm -hmm. So it's just is, awareness, yeah? Just a top of funnel. Yeah. It's literally just something that's in front of you. There's no, there's no option to engage with it, but they pay so much money for that because it's just branding presence. Mm -hmm. um, so if I compare that to like what you do with influencers, it's, it's pretty reasonable. They're just getting your, your name out there, getting your brand out there. They're definitely not as expensive as a, a billboard on the highway. Mm -hmm. That's for fucking sure. So, uh, yeah, I think if you look at it that way, mm, people, yeah. the problem is that people sell it like you sponsor an influencer, mm -hmm. they're going to get you reach. Plus they're going to convert sales for mm -hmm. you and stuff like that. That's an unrealistic expectation. I mean, that makes sense. Influencers. influencers should be the top of the funnel, the first layer of awareness. Instead of being the yeah. last over there, like your your I mean, job you is no. If you want to convert sales for mm -hmm. you, then hire a fucking salesperson, and you can put them full time, pay them fifty thousand dollars a year or whatever. You know, like that's like minimum wage, and they can do that for you. If you're going to give an influencer a thousand dollars, then all you can really possibly expect is just reach. But some influencers step it up. Like I would always say, like Doctor Disrespect. If you watch when he sells out, he's so good at it because he incorporates the product like into, you know, like if he's playing a game and he gets a kill because he heard someone coming, mm -hmm. he'll always talk about his Turtle Beach headphones. You know, he'll always encourage people, oh, you need to get, you know, Turtle Beach if you want to play that. When he's, when he's playing with other people, you know, they don't hear something, he'll always, he'll always tell them because mm -hmm. it's like, it's a practical application of what he's sponsored by. Um, so he does a really good job of it, but. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, your examples are like, mostly overseas, right? Yeah, overseas examples, right? So do you, how much do you think it's about the audience, that overseas audience are more, let's say, they donate more, they support more, right? Or how much you think it's about the audience or how much you think about the person itself? Like, do you think anyone in Malaysia or SCA is capable to reach that standards? Yeah, of course. I mean, they, they are already, but do you think it's, it's easy in that sense? It's doable. No, nothing. It's never easy to get to that genuine Yeah, I rephrase point. that. Mm -hmm. People can always... Point. There's, I think there's a few stats floating around specifically with Southeast Asia and mm -hmm. like consumption of video via social media whereas that certain places like Vietnam you know like the the consumption crazy. of yeah. capita is very high um, so you could, you could argue that it's maybe a little easier for them mm -hmm. because their audience is more conducive to watching content that way mm -hmm. um, but then again then it's, and it's harder to put a good price on it so it all balances out in the end how do you think? I think it's more impressive to have a small following in Singapore than mm -hmm. it is to have a massive following in Vietnam or Thailand. So the percentage of reach and engagement. Yeah. If your audience is like, has more spending power, mm -hmm. such as like a Singaporean audience versus, you know, a Vietnamese audience, then that in some ways is much more valuable to certain brands than other brands. How do you see sports in Malaysia going for the next two, three years, you know, with all this coming? I mean, next five years, I would say. What do you think about it? Like esports specifically? I don't know. It's a lot of nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, there's $20 million, sorry, 20 million ringgit in the budget for yeah. esports. Oh, what the fuck does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. Remember all the dickheads who were like, I'm going to give 10 million ringgit. First, it was Razor. I imagine when Razor says stuff like that, they probably already had a 10 million ringgit marketing budget set for that year. Like, I don't, I don't believe that that means anything to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, it might mean that they have more budget to sponsor tournaments 
which is really the only thing. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing, really. Like, sponsoring teams and tournaments makes a direct impact mm-hmm. to the esports ecosystem, sure. But I have a feeling that, like, they would include, like, Facebook ads for a Kraken headset as part of their, like, investment in esports to the region. And then you had uh, GameView, which was just, like, another shitty blockchain nonsense platform that's just looking to raise money and then exit. But they all will also put 10 million ringgit into the the esports economy in Malaysia. Who the fuck knows what happened to that? Um, you know, like, their whole website was just full of direct lies and contradictions about what their product is. And then there was already 10 million in the in the budget previously for esports in Malaysia, so I don't know what the hell happened to that. So you think there's um, no transparency of where they spend your 10 million or 20 million? Yeah, and this is a discussion I had with another journalist in Malaysia recently where it's like, when when it's with the private industry of esports, mm-hmm. you don't have any right to question them. You know, if Logitech says we're doing this, it's really all up to them. You, you can't ask to see their books. You know, you can't ask to see where they put yeah. the money. But as soon as one cent of public government money is spent mm. on esports, then you have every right to demand transparency. And um, I think, sadly, a lot of media in esports, not just in Malaysia, they feel they need to, to be relevant in the industry. They need to be advocates. Mm-hmm. Like, we need to cheer on esports. And, oh, our company announced something. We think that's great. Oh, what awesome news. But that's really detrimental to the whole ecosystem because now you just get this cycle of companies just like we'll just sign a memorandum memorandum of understanding to say oh yes uh you know singtel and skt are going to join together to help build esports skt sign the mou everyone writes about it an mou is just it's like saying yeah i'll probably do it and uh that's it. it it's not binding or anything like that so it, when people just keep giving in to this whole PR cycle of mm-hmm. like companies saying they're going to do something, they write about it incredibly positively mm-hmm. without ever having questions being answered. Mm-hmm. And then it just fades away. People forget about it. And uh, they'll just do it again the next time something's announced. So uh, I think, but again, I actually still think Malaysian esports is like quite healthy, mm-hmm. <laughs> like on a realistic scale. Uh-huh. Um, just not on the, you know, it, it doesn't match the lies told about it by the industry, but it, on a realistic level, I think it's good. Do you, do you think it's uh, the Malaysian esports has a good barrier of entry, or is it very monopolized by the top few dogs up there? No. Nah. Top few players. No, I don't think so. I mean, esports is competitive, right? Mm-hmm. The you, if you're not good, then why would you expect anything? People always say that there should be more healthy tiers of competition Mm -hmm. where it's like if you're a tier three player Mm -hmm. the ecosystem should be healthy enough for you to be able to earn enough money Mm -hmm. but i I don't know if you're not good enough to win anything then maybe you've picked the wrong industry or maybe you're just not as good as you thought you are but there's so much shit every game has so much shit to play in in malaysia you know and it's like even dota that's like a dying game that that doesn't even, you know, like, completely taken over by Mobile Legends and PUBG Mobile. Mm-hmm. You still have, like, ESL in Malaysia and Singapore mm-hmm. that do tournaments. You know, like, there just seems to be a tournament every fucking week. Do you, okay, this is a good question. Do you think that people, especially players or people in Malaysia, there's a name for themselves, are wasting their brand equity? Like, many of the players come into esports wanting to play, right? And they build a brand following around them. Like, do you think that they underestimate how strong that their brand equity is at an age around, let's say, 25, 30, and how it could extend in the long run? Yeah, yeah, a lot of players uh, are, like... Like, you, you, saw, you saw TSM recently, right? How TSM signed Bjergsen, one of their League of Legends mid planer, as a shareholder and all, and it's yeah, yeah, yeah. starting to show that it's, it is business. They want him, he's a good player, yes, but it's mostly because his name right? He made the brand famous and that's what's going to make the company famous, right? I'm pretty sure most companies or most esport orgs want their star product or their star player in that sense. Do you think players are trying, are, are not realizing the potential that they have and the brand equity they hold? 
to build around it. I mean, I don't think I've spoken to enough Malaysian players to understand the attitude around that, though I'll say that most of them seem pretty oblivious to the business side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and that reflects in what they complain about. And uh, I guarantee you, if players were more often, you know, shareholders as part of the company, you would see less player churn, you would see, you know, more retention and more loyalty and probably harder work. But equity is pretty precious, especially when equity is really how esports teams get money by selling equity. So I mean, give you equity away. The, the players got the equity, not cause it's cause of their prolonged several years of you know, branding, helping the company, helping the organization build. It wasn't just like, oh, you know, we want you and got equity. So the thing is up towards the players to show their worth instead of just the company just giving you equity because, you know, you're just a player. Like, you can yeah, win all the time. There's no point, right? It's not going to let yeah, us when grow. You're a small team, mm -hmm. right? So the players, obviously their perception is the way they make money is through winning. Mm. And maybe they get a little salary to help them live. Mm. But the owners are basically in it to, to be acquired. Mm -hmm. They're in it to exit. Mm -hmm. So they want to get bought out. So obviously they don't want to be giving away their equity to, to players, you know, unless those players are wildly successful and in it for the long run. And the, you know, like if you're TSM, mm -hmm. you probably have longer ambitions, mm -hmm. but if you're, you know, like tiny esports org, like it's like, it's like areas are saying, I mean, obviously the, the, that team saying that the end goal of that team was to get acquired by someone bigger. Mm -hmm. And so then when, you know, Tony Fernandez comes along and purchases them, then founder owner takes their payout job done. And then they move on to the next thing. That, that's how the kind of startup economy works. So it, it sounds nice to have players have equity. And I think it would contribute to, like their performance and engagement and loyalty in the long run because they're part of the business then. And I think that's the case with all startups, not just esports. But at the same time, I don't think it's realistic to expect tier three and tier four teams to be like giving players who've played for them for two months, you know. No, but, no we're, we're talking about whether players undervalue that their mindset is we need to win to get money. They're undervaluing the fact that winning is not everything, whereas... I need to get my name out there known in the scene to get money. No. That's something you should think about when you're, when you're like a PPD. Mm -hmm. Like you've already done everything in esports. And now you're looking to see how you use that to like, you know, have longevity, be a bit more business minded. But I think if you're like 19 and you're not big yet, mm -hmm. you should be winning is everything. It's a competition. Like you, you wouldn't expect like a 17 year old Roger Federer to be like, you know, spending weeks thinking about a deal with Nike, right? Mm -hmm. He would let his age agent or manager do it. All he would ever care about is winning, right? Because that's that's what enables all this to happen. That's true. So I really don't think... Maybe, maybe that's where, like, players' unions um, or having a good manager will, will come in more and more prevalence in the future. Mm -hmm. But, I don't know, if you're a young esports player, just fucking win. Just win be or good. be entertaining. That's that's the fucking. Those are the two things, and all the biggest streamers on Twitch are a combination of good and entertaining. There's no one who's like just good and just entertaining. You know, like they're all a combination of both. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, just win. You're a competitive player. Just win. just get good. Just get good. If you're bad, just quit. Right? It's not. Just it's win. not. It's not a career path for you if it's not right. Yeah, unless you're very funny. <laughs> then you could probably <laughs> could be an influencer then, but no, I don't know. That's a weird question. That, that would really be like owner to owner would have their different perspective on what they would do with the equity they could give away, I would imagine. That makes sense. I mean, there are some billionaires who like feel that, uh, I think it's like Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban? His name is. About what? I think all of his... Oh yeah, Mark, Mark Cuban, Mark Cuban. Anyone, anyone who stays for a prolonged amount of time? When yeah, they show their worth, for, they used to have shares. yeah, and then they'll the be shares. more loyal. You know? mm -hmm. What's that? And then, and then, uh, you know, your success is the the company's success is your success mm -hmm. when you're a shareholder, right? Mm -hmm. And then, then people don't complain so much about working those extra few unpaid hours and like putting in more than they should because they want to see the the fruits of their labor. Mm -hmm. And if you're working for an hourly wage, then you'll never really see that. 
Um, so it makes sense, but I just don't think that many players are actually in the position to demand a part of the company or a piece of the company. That makes sense. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it does make sense. Did you demand a, a, a stake in Fire Dragoon? No, I did a shit job, so I didn't demand shit, yeah? Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, young and foolish, try everything out. Why not? <laughs> Even now, still. But yeah. I really if, liked Fire Dragoon. I think it was like a shit. Yeah, they, they, were, they were nice people. They were nice people. <laughs> yeah, they were just 60% owned by a scam. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Calm down there. Calm but down there. outside of that, they were actually an awesome brand. It's sad. They're still around. Just they're, they're still around. Yeah, they're Frostfire now. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot about it. That's, That's the key of Malaysian esports. You work with a scam, and then you just change your name, and then everything's fine. That's all that's required to 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 wipe the slate clean. Do do you think they're that's off? my tip? <laughs> that's work your tip. With a scam. Change your name, and you're fine. <laughs> Do you think there are a lot of, like you said, scamish organizations out there? <laughs> more, how much more? Like more than the legit ones? What's the percentage like? What do you think? In esports? Yeah. 90% fraud. What? 90% fraud. What do you mean by fraud? Uh, like, it's pretty broad when you say fraud, lies, right? It can be even... Lies, dishonesty, fake business, fake numbers, fake everything. Like how, can you dive into it a bit more? Because people can... Yes, I mean, people say that they are doing this much when they're not doing this much. Wouldn't it be sheets of data, sheets of stuff, analytics for to show the yeah. clients and all? Just lie about everything. Huh? Lie about their profits, lie about the people they work with, lie about reach. Uh, yeah, they just lie. That's, that's the beauty of Malaysian esports. It's built on lies. And so it's even more impressive when things are like... I mean, all of esports is... There's a lot of fraud, but it's extremely prevalent in Southeast Asia. But it's just like... When you get your hands on like the decks of some of these teams, like mm -hmm. the pitch decks, and what they claim to be, um, it's like pure dishonesty. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I don't know if I'm more angry at liars or like respect them because a lot, so many of these like marketing agencies are so fucking useless that they'll still give these, these people money. Uh, I don't know who to blame in that situation, but uh, yeah. I mean, sure. that's how I got remotely known, right? Is is talking about certain scams. Um, oh. Yeah. Well, what, they're what, pretty easy to talk about because they just lie about everything. So if you just show it to people, then they look at it and they go, oh, well, this is all lies. And then that, then it's it's pretty clear to see. Yeah, I always wonder, well, why did you stop? Like, you, you were on a roll for like a few months and all talking about stuff like that and you got known here and there. Like, all of a sudden it stopped. Why is it because of IGNC? Well, because oh, I, no, no, I, so I moved into more of like a business development part mm -hmm. of IGN. Mm -hmm. Like I was trying to, um, yeah, I was trying to monetize stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just, just learning different parts of the business that once I was in that side of it, I didn't really need to worry about. I mean, I still like have, I, I hate dishonesty. And so it, it triggers me when I see. I see stuff that's just like straight up lie, especially when it's to do with esports, because it just makes me so mad. And do you have any hot takes that you have not told anyone yet? Come on, <laughs> recently in this year, also. I don't think I ever hold anything back. I'm sure everyone knows how I feel about all these like esports evangelist style people, you know, who do conferences and just say bullshit, and then like they're the kind of people who like hold a press conference. Mm -hmm. invite five media uh four of the media write about it and then they say oh it went viral like it just like there's no connection between reality and and what actually happens and then here's the really weird thing mm -hmm. about esports in malaysia if you are an honest person who tries and fails mm -hmm. the esports community will eviscerate you they will bully you they'll mock you they'll tear you down by showing you what you tried to do and what you failed to do. Mm -hmm. However, if you're like a Fallout gaming, which are just liars and just just nonsense and just like pure hyperbole and just like talking a big game and never delivering it, 
with such such dishonesty that it's like baffling the community will never call them out you know if you're an absolute fraud the community won't call you out your esm you know aegis and all that kind of thing like well actually aegis got called out plenty but it's just like people are so <laughs> tired of it because they know they'll never get their money but um yeah it's like an honest person will get ripped apart if they fail but when a liar fails no one no one says anything no one calls it out because it's almost just like they just know that's part of the game and then they'll still go into work with those liars later because they're slick talkers they'll get a budget from another company that they've never worked with before oh we've got another tournament you know and then suddenly everyone wants to work with them again i mean fallout given disbanded didn't it like they changed or something yeah now they're the gaming co i mean i don't really follow them anymore uh-huh. um i'm shocked that they still even operate because it's op- like i shouldn't say i'm shocked that they operate i'm shocked that people still work with them given their track record and how bad it is but their business is bigger than esports i know that they do other stuff maybe they're successful in other industries the results matters um, yeah i mean FD. this is one I, of money I'm people sure they, be- do, they do normal normal business stuff but it's like every everything they touch in esports turns to like uh, trash and it's like when they represented Malaysian esports, they brought it into disrepute with how bad their tournament was. They almost set Dendi on fire. What? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what? and then when they represent Southeast Asian esports, it's a fucking disaster. And then when they did international esports, where they hosted a major, mm-hmm. um, it's the only major from, from that Valve ever took major status away from. Um, and as far as I know, from what I see on Twitter, the players aren't even paid yet their prize money because it was funded by a scam. So you hit them a lot. They're yeah. still around. Just change your name. Just change your name, and everything will be fine. <laughs> Two years I'm back, I'm thinking of killing someone and then changing my name and seeing if I can get away with it. Put a register, it change my name to Whedon Dane. You know, no one would know. Different surname. I could, yeah. My middle name's Luke. I feel like I could be a Luke, so I'll just. I'll you look like a Luke. Luke. Yeah. I didn't do anything. Dane did it. I'm Luke. I, I, it's not me. Other than esports, eventually, is anything that recently up your mind in regards to esports in Malaysia that you think it's something that should be changed, but it's not. It's not my place to say what should be changed. Huh? Even I mean, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Observation for observation. I mean, not not restricted to Malaysia. Let's just say in general, for APEC oh, in just, Australia, all the problems come from dishonesty. You know, it's like, and you know, like if you look at like uh, to connect to what I just said before, where it's like the people who try and fail mm-hmm. get shit on. Why? Well, why? Why do you think so? Because I just look at like like what what gets published by players in, in terms of like complaints do the like players complaints. shit on them or do the upper management or organizations from other companies try to find some way to shit on them to bring them down no, no, no. i mean people from organizations uh-huh. really shit on other people because they're and like it's like you look at like with uh what happened with uh air asia saying and mpl whatever the mm-hmm. mobile legend tournament yeah, was yeah, in yeah. Indonesia. i remember when the rules they had issues with the rules mm-hmm. and they took this incredibly obnoxious and it like grandstanding stance that we're going to pull out of this tournament because you know like we're market leaders and mm-hmm. this is wrong because there's an error with the rules and there shouldn't be an error mm-hmm. and if this organizer ever organizes it again we, we won't come mm-hmm. which is brilliant because they lost their team not long after that <laughs> but it's like then the same people ran wesgc and they changed the rules on one of the dota teams so it's like they're absolute hypocrites and that's why you don't people in organizations don't necessarily shit on other events and stuff like that because they know how easy it is for mistakes to happen and you'll look like a fucking idiot which they did um by grandstanding and acting like you're you know you're so good and then you make the same mistakes but worse um so that's why people don't do that but the community shits on anyone they want really because it's, it's community see of voices <laughs> who would never be held accountable for what they say um so yeah it's like i I just feel that uh i can't remember what i was talking about because of that what what was the question you asked me i talk about basically your thoughts 
what would you change in regards to your observations in the esports scenes? Bring the observation to... is ah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> if people are just honest from the get go, mm -hmm. then I think it would disarm so many of the problems that happens in Malaysian esports. Because mm -hmm. like, so many things come from misunderstandings, because people weren't realistic about their situation. Mm -hmm. And like, if you look at GESC, mm -hmm. you know, that was the startup from Singapore mm -hmm. that originally Valve gave four miners to mm -hmm. KL, Singapore, Jakarta, and Thailand was going to be in Bangkok. Then. So it's like all the way to the end, they just went through with everything mm -hmm. and they, they didn't have any money. Like none of the, none of the players are paid. And it's like, somewhere along the line these people knew mm -hmm. that things went wrong mm -hmm. you know like something went wrong and and sponsors pulled out or whatever but if you're not honest or realistic about it at any stage and you just keep up the face of like everything's fine <laughs> well you're gonna look like such a fucking piece of shit when it all falls apart whereas if you're just honest from the start no honesty is disarming and anything that goes wrong, if you're honest about it the whole way, people have a hard time being mad at you. And to me, that was the one of the biggest things in my time working in Malaysia was like, so often people just lied and were like, everything's fine. Oh, this is good. You know, like when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And it only ends up biting them in the ass later when it all falls apart. Where, you know, like, just be realistic and you probably would have had sympathy and understanding from everyone. And, you know, you wouldn't have people... But but but, but you just said if you be honest it'd be nice to get shit on by people and you feel if you feel <laughs> No, that's it. No, but that's why they get shit on, right? Uh. Because I mean their effort was honest. Mm -hmm. So like I mean you you wanted to do a tournament, maybe you had a friend who mm -hmm. worked in marketing at Intel and mm -hmm. they're like they maybe they made some promises. Mm -hmm. So you just did things honestly. You didn't you didn't go to like a literal scam and be like, Hey, I'll take your money. And I'll play your ad, even though your ad has like copyrighted material that you've just pasted your logo over. Um, you know, it's just like a straight up illegal, dishonest lie. But I'll take your money. Like, if you're like, no, 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 I'm doing it the right way. I'm trying to do it realistically. Right. Then you fail. Mm -hmm. People will shit on you. But if you're honest about like what's happening at all times, you know, if if your sponsor pulls out at the last minute, like. Mm -hmm. You can be honest about that, right? And no yeah. one's going to blame you. They're going to blame the, the sponsor who pulled out. But if you don't say anything, go ahead with the event. Because in your mind, like, oh, I'm going to make up money and I'm going to... I'll start using the numbers from this tournament to plan the next tournament. So mm -hmm. I'll get a sponsor for the next tournament and I'll take that money and pay the prize money for this tournament, which is what happens. And they fail. It's like, you just look like the biggest piece of shit in the world, even though probably you did get screwed over. But you'll never be able to play that card now because you didn't say anything. You just kept going with it and said everything was fine. All right, last question. Uh, so yeah, recently, I think I've posted this on Facebook before, that I saw people complaining, mostly small, small part-timers, yeah, those like one, two, three K contract workers, they're complaining about how organizations form contracts with them, but they end up paying up them or they, pay, or de or they delay the pay. And they know that the fact that they can't do anything because most of them aren't to say, have the capability to sue the organization. You know, too much time, too much effort, too much money involved and all those kind of things. And I've been actually seeing that for like a couple of years now. Like, what, what do you think is going on? Like, If what, your what's... pay is delayed a couple of years. No, 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 sorry, sorry. I mean, the pay is... Be... <laughs> I've been seeing this thing going on for a couple of years about the pay getting delayed by a couple of months. Yeah, that's happened to me. Mm. My pay has been delayed months before. And, uh, you know, like I never get an explanation as to why. Is it like an esports thing or is it like a general most companies? I I don't think most companies, large companies would have that. Because it's like, a, I understand the monthly thing or a three months thing because of finance shit and all. But getting paid delayed by a lot, it's pretty... Back back to my initial statement that honesty <laughs> is disarming. So it's like, when I was owed money, uh -huh. it's not that... Not the delay that bothered me as much as the why I did not know it was delayed. Mm -hmm. So if someone says to me, for example, that a client, you know, their client didn't pay. It, sometimes in marketing, what happens is that, yeah, credit. you know, they have a, a, a business that takes a long time to pay them. And mm. so then they have to pay you. And mm. 
Yeah. But all of that is just about clear communication. And that's what's consistently lacking in, in these kind of things. That's why people have to go to social media to be like, hey, this company has not paid me for three months, even though they just announced they raised $5 million or whatever. You know, it's like, it doesn't line up. Why are they not paying me? People feel they have to do that just to get the attention. But it's just like, if someone just says to me, oh, like, we made a mistake or like, uh, you know, we, we, we're waiting for the investor's money to come in or mm -hmm. like the, the agency that hires us hasn't paid us yet. Mm -hmm. Clear communication solves everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only in lieu of communication that people get frustrated. They go to social media. Everyone ends up looking bad. And uh, it's so, so easily avoided if you just address the problem at the start, not the end. It does happen. Of course it happens. Um, I understand it. The credit issue and all the line now. Yeah. yeah. Or, or a mistake was made or something, you know, like, I don't think anybody chooses to willfully not pay someone unless they hate them. <laughs> I mean, maybe that would be fun, but you know, I, obviously everyone wants to look good. Mm -hmm. So maybe, and I was thinking this the other day, like, I wonder what would happen if, if an invoice, when you sent the invoice, yeah. you included a late fee mm -hmm. in it. So if you write, like, for example, the invoice, if this is not paid, mm -hmm. Um, within 30 days, there'll be like a 5% late fee. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, if that's like feasible or if any, any kind of like freelancer has ever like done that, but it's a double edged sword because as a freelancer, you always want work mm -hmm. and, uh, you, you, you dance a delicate line between like not antagonizing your clients, but still, you know, being treated with respect and being paid in a reasonable manner. It's very tempting to just go to your clients and just be like, why the fuck haven't you cunts paid me yet, you pieces of shit? But realistically, you have to be like, I'm just inquiring. Uh, because, you know, it's been a while. Is this an update on my payment? Where is it? No, I'm still here. Don't forget about me, you know? I'm just saying. Yeah, that, that's what it's like. And uh, and most of the animosity goes away once you get paid. Even if it's three, four months late. Once you get paid, it's just like, everything's fine now. I don't care about anything. <laughs> It's fine, you know, those three months you owe me, it's fine. Let's work again, yeah? I mean, yeah. you have no choice. I mean, it's, it's about the money. It's easy to get angry, but clear communication solves everything, in my my opinion. So in Dane's, Dane Whedon's opinion, basically, if an esports, two things, yeah? Honesty, stop being dicks, and communication. Honesty <laughs> and clear communication is all you need to be a... a you can still be shit at your job. You can still fail. But if you're honest, people won't hate you. You most probably would still fail, but people won't hate you. Yeah. That that's makes right. sense. And it's more important to, to fail and still people like you <laughs> than to fail and, and be the worst person in the world. <laughs> All right. Wise words from Dane. Thanks a lot, Dane, <laughs> for doing that's these right. podcasts with me. I'm pretty bad at this, no. but, you know, it's always the first time. Thank you. <laughs> the first time. <laughs>